Hey, what's up YouTube? Uh, this is Systemis, and I'm going to do the walkthrough for my track Dragon's Gamble, uh, which just came out of Mousetrap, and I really like the track. I hope you guys like the track. I'm going to show you how I made the track, so we're going to get through it right now. So this is just my raw project file from final render to sending it out to uh, distribution. I didn't touch it. This is how it was made. Uh, this is how the project looked when I finished the track. I didn't pretty it up, I didn't clean it up. Oh, I'm making a tutorial, let me clean it up, label everything, name it, color code it. I didn't do any of that. This is real. This is what the real project file looked like. So we're just gonna go in, um, see how it looks, see what's in here. Uh, the only rule I have is automation goes directly under what's, it, what's affecting. And then I don't care after that, things can go anywhere. Like we have all the drums up here, we have a random effects effects, the bells, the bass, violins, vocals, synth, and then effects at the very bottom as well. And then automations apply directly underneath it. So like, uh, let me go to selectors, so you can see. All these automations right here are all for the bass. All these automations right here are all for the bell because it, it goes like um, descending underneath. This one effect is for that uh, effect. This is for that effect. This is for those drums, the kick. So it, the way I arrange my project is kind of like that. I have the automation effect directly was underneath it. So let's jump right in here. Um, let's see, I think if I remember when I wrote this song, the star of the project was this bell sound. I'm pretty sure I started with that. Let's play that. Let's play the pattern. Let me open up the piano roll. So that's pretty much it. This is the uh, entire idea of the track. Everything was built around this. Uh, I started with this. A lot of times when I'm producing, I'll just make melodies and then see if I can turn it into anything. Um, a lot of times I start with a bell, which I'll, I'll go into later, because it's like such a simple and clean um, like sounding synth that you can just, it's like, it doesn't distract you from the melody. You can just mess with the notes and make a melody out of it without worrying about sound. It sounds good, you don't have to worry about sound design. Um, you can just lay down a melody with it. I actually kept the bell for this track because I thought it sounded really pretty with the other elements I came up with. So the bell ended up staying in. Um, so this melody it's like a five note cycle it starts up top one two three four five and then it repeats uh and so as i go through the whole cycle it ends up hitting a little bit extra there's a little like two uh what's a bar a bar is four four it's about half a bar left over uh so it doesn't loop perfectly every time it loops there's gonna be a little bit of hangover that pushes the melody farther and farther over every time so that it builds like a polyrhythm on top of everything else going on the track, which I thought was pretty cool. And I thought that it would be enough variety to carry a track. Cause sometimes you think, oh, four bars of this and oh, I need to add, add another synth or I need to add another melody or sound or stack a seventh on top of it. I, I figured that if I just kept the polyrhythm moving and shifting, it would add enough diversity into the track that I don't need to add all those extra layers and I could keep it on the simpler side. All right, so for the sound design for that main sound, uh, we used Serum. Everyone loves Serum, I love Serum. Uh, it's a great synth. I'm sure all of you know about it. I don't have to go into detail about it. Um, there's better places to learn about Serum if you want to, but pretty much um, have a sign here, uh, which is minus four, and then I have my sub, which is plus one. So the real source of the bell sound is actually my sub. Like if I play this and then I mute oscillator B, it sounds basically exactly the same, right? Um, the reason why I have this is for later on in the track, there's a, um, a distortion that comes in. And well, I'll, I'll show you when, when we get there, but pretty much this, the primary bell sound in the first half of the track is just the sub oscillator, sine shape, plus one. We have a hyperdimension, a distortion which is disabled, which we'll talk about when we get to that part of the track. 
um, and a little bit of reverb. Um, yeah, I had some FM from noise I was experimenting with. Like if we turn on the noise, you can hear that like, ch -ch -ch -ch. I was experimenting with it, but I ended up not keeping it in the track. Um, I could have disabled FM from noise, it's not doing anything, but like I said, this is just the real project. And when I'm producing, I produce fast. I don't like to clean up my mistakes. I just abandon them. So uh, you're going to see a lot of things that are like disabled that aren't working that I just didn't remove from the project. Because this is just, you know, it's like a, it's like a photo. This is what the project looked like when I rendered my final render. So uh, it's just things are going to be there. Uh, okay. So now let's go into the mixer and let's see the effects I put on this. So got the bell here. Um, it's going into the synth bus, which I'll explain my uh, mixer process later as well once we're done with the track. I have on the bell a Ferric TDS, which is I love this little thing. It's a free distortion plugin if you like distortion. We got a parametric EQ, um, stock FL. Just doing a little bit of boost uh, at this range and a little cut at this range. And it's a boost was at 900. 900 cut, about 380 boost. Just because the, the bell had different... I want to boost the lower notes and cut down the higher notes. Higher notes are always a lot sharper on your ear. So like, instead of like the low notes, like here in volume and here in volume, by doing those boost and cut, it kind of brings them more to an even level. So it's just about trying to balance the bell out. Um, I have a black hole, which is really amazing reverb. I got this on a Black Friday sale, like 30 bucks. It's pretty sweet. Yeah, I'm just doing, throwing a little bit of reverb on there. I think you can hear a difference. Here, it sounds kind of dry. And then the black hole just gives it a ton of space. Not even that wet. It's not even like that activated. It's only 27%. It, it adds so much to it. Um, I got another parametric. This is just a low pass. Um, later on in the track, I low pass it. So it's not really, it's not doing anything. Um, I have a serum FX, which is a delay which I also activate later in the track. You can see it's turned off right here. I have another EQ because the first EQ didn't do enough of the cut. Um, it's almost like I boosted it too much. So I wanted to uh, recut those frequencies I boosted, um, which I do a lot. Uh, people might say it's crazy, but like, I'll, I'd rather boost and then cut it back out as opposed to just not boost in the first place. I don't know if that's like a superstition thing. It's like, I always prefer the way a sound sounds after it's been processed and then reprocessed as opposed to like unprocessed. I don't know. It, it's probably just my own ears, but I always like to, if I boost something, I'd rather recut it out as opposed to changing the original boost. It's just, it's just how I like to do things. Um, and then there's another delay, which comes in at the end of the track. Um, so that's also disabled right now. And then I have gross beat for my sidechain, which is, uh, this is an envelope that I drew on the volume and I named it sidechain and, um, it ha follows this envelope, which I have it disabled just so you can listen to the bell. But during the track, I'd have the sidechain enabled you can. And when it has this shape, it's like the second pump of the side chain on the one, two, three, four, the two and the four cut a lot more. They're, the volume doesn't let it come out as high. It's uh, cut a lot more. So it just, it gives more of a push pull feeling to the side chain. And I use this shape on like almost everything. I used to do all square, but lately, like almost every track now, I'll just always use every single sound. I'll do the half pump. Um, I think it just sounds, a lot better. It's really subtle, but I think it makes a difference. Uh, so that's pretty much the lead sound of the track. And now we'll go on to the bass. All right, so I got the bass right here. Uh, let's open up the pattern. So the bass is pretty simple. It's playing a one note, a G, was that G sharp? And it goes into a B. Oh, is that G or D? Oh, it's D. I, I had to set, I had to move my screens back. They're usually closer because of like my green screen and my camera set up to film this, with like the, the ring lights. So my screen is farther away. So it's hard to see stuff right now, especially from the, like the glare, the ring light on the screen. But, um, 
Yeah, it, don't worry about it. So we have a D sharp correction, D sharp. And then we have a B as the two notes. And this does follow the one, two, three, four, whatever you want to call that structure of the track. So the melody, the bell melody is going to be playing a poly to this bass line. Um, so the sound design is it's just some FM uh, type wave tables. Uh, this one is like, it's kind of, they're kind of signy. Like this one's kind of like a sign. This one is kind of, because everything's rounded, nothing sharp. Um, just kind of soft. And I'm not like doing any FM between them. You can see both FM's disabled. We're just playing both oscillators. Like the level of one is a little bit less than the other. What is this, like 36%? This one's at 67%. So one is lower than the other, but they're both playing. Oh wait, yeah, solo. Um, so it's just two wavetables, and then I have a compressor, distortion, a low pass, reverb was disabled. At one point I probably wanted the reverb, and then I decided to scratch it. Uh, and then I have a low pass, and you can see here that like the envelope goes low, and then it goes high. And that's because it just, just like the side chain, it gives it a little bit of a different feel to the track. You can hear like the second pump it opens up a lot more um and if i had it all the way up for both you can hear it just it just doesn't have the, the same feel it doesn't feel as pumpy so when you pull it down that's when it starts to feel like all right this is a groove right it starts to feel groovy it feels like just like a wall of noise because it's pretty much what the bass is, it's just playing the note constantly. When you're playing it with the bells, it sounds uh, pretty nice. Uh, let's check the mixer out. So of course, again, I have Ferric. Very cool, very cool uh, distortion plugin. Uh, I just have a, a bunch of subtle boosts here. I have a boost at like 395, 1320, 4K. Um, I'm just trying to bring up a little bit of the frequencies that exist out there in like the nether regions honestly like you don't see it and you don't hear it but like if you the thing is like even if you don't see it on the parametric if you cut those frequencies out you would hear the difference you would hear that's missing that high range even if it's super quiet and subtle it's still there and so little boosts like this can still affect the sound we then have a, just a low pass and we have a high pass so those are just um used later in the track so I have the Maximus here as well, and this is kind of like one of those artifacts. Usually what I do with the Maximus is I like to level out my sub. I like to make, because I have two different notes, I want the sub notes to be the same volume for the for the 100 hertz region. Like I have 100 hertz, uh, was it 85 hertz? Close enough. I have, I have 85 hertz targeted, obviously like the low end. Um, and usually I would want this all to be the same volume, so I threw Maximus on to check it. Uh, but it was all the same volume. The two notes were honestly they're pretty similar. I didn't feel the need to do any kind of compression because it was close enough, and I I was fine with the limit level of difference in volume that was happening between the two notes. So um, I just left the maximus on chain. I didn't touch it, and I didn't do anything with it. And then again, we have the side chain which I disabled. If we turn on the side chain, you can hear it. This makes it more pumpy. Okay, so the other synth sound, which we don't have very many synth sounds in here. Where is it? Is this thing right? Tunnel? Uh, let's see. Yeah, so let me turn off the sidechain. This sound um, is a sample from a Vengeance pack, which this is something I love to do is Vengeance has a ton of synth sounds little chord hits, little stabs. Um, and like when you're looking for add a little flavor to your track, they're absolutely perfect. You just toss in, you resample them, you modify them. So the original sample, I'm pretty sure, let me duplicate this uh, clone. I'm pretty sure the original sample sound like this. Let me send it to like a blank mixer channel. Let's see, 2032, sure. This is the original, and I decided to uh, reverse it if I turn off the FX. I decided to reverse it like that, and then I processed it, and it, it, 
it gives it's pretty cool sound that like adds some character to the track a little bit. I did some EQ. I cut out a ton of the high end, a ton of the low end. I just wanted really just the mid range. And I have a serum FX, which is adding a ton of delay and a little bit of reverb. Um, then I also have the side chain, which I disabled. And my FL broke. Uh, we'll be back momentarily. Sweet. Hey. Okay, we're back. Uh, where were we? So let's talk about um the vocals. Woohoo! So, uh, this is a sample pack vocal. Uh, I don't remember where I got the sample pack. I like to look on uh, different sites. I don't like to go on Splice just because like everyone's done Splice, right? Everyone has Splice. You can always tell, oh, well, this track is from this song, right? So I, I like to at least go to like um, less less popular sample sites to buy sample vocals uh, just so there's less chance someone's used it before, which is not a big deal. And honestly, like I could get a vocalist if I wanted to go down that route, but uh, I tend to like to destroy vocals, if you've heard Era Of before, from my last release. The vocals got absolutely trashed with distortion and chopping and glitching and reversing. And they got kind of trashed on this track too. Let's not, let's be real. Um, so sometimes when you're talking to vocalists, you're like, hey, can you record this? So I can destroy it. They're kind of like, you know, their feelings get involved and they want their vocals to not get, you know, trashed. So sometimes if you're gonna like go down this route, it's easier just to use a sample pack. No one's gonna care. You can do whatever you want to it. You don't have to ask permission. Like, hey, do you care if I totally make you sound un un unintelligible? Is that the word? Un un unintelligible. You know what I'm talking about. The the word that means you don't know what they're saying. Anyway, so yeah, I use a sample pack just so I can do whatever I wanted. Uh, let's just go through the vocal. Oh, I shot the side chain, which is always on. So this is the first half of vocals, um, and I've re this isn't like obviously the name of the sample isn't BPM one twenty eight vox number two. This is like resampled and reprocessed. It's multiple renders of uh, layers of processing. Uh, so I can't show you the original processing because it's already done and rendered and gone. I don't save that kind of stuff. I just move on. Um, but what I can show you is what I've done with it here. So I have the serum effects. If it's gonna open, watch it crash again. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, so we have a chorus uh, and a delay. Now the chorus, I really went back and forth on this track. This is one of the points that like had me, you know, every day I'd switch it on and off as I'm producing. I couldn't decide what I wanted to go with because I liked the sound of the chorus. It makes it sound kind of ghostly. It's a little bit detuned and I like that. Uh, it gives it a kind of ethereal vibe. If I turn it off, uh, it's probably gonna be a little bit louder. It's still good. It's just it, it's it's too clean. I don't like clean vocals very much. Something about the chorus kind of smears it around a little bit and spreads it out, and I I think I like that more. I like that more, so I end up going with the chorus. Uh, then of course they have black hole, but this is really wet. I really verb this out. I love having my vocals totally drenched in reverb, drenched in delay, um, just like to make it sound not as much like a normal singer as possible. 
uh, then more delay on top of it, which it gets triggered later in the breakdown. I'll show you where, and they have a little EQ. Um, just cutting lows, boosting highs, you know, the standard stuff uh, that I do for vocals. I don't know if it's standard for what other people do for vocals, but it's what I like to do to vocals. Um, and then sidechain, uh, standard, standard, standard. Uh, so I, I did chop up the vocals a little bit right here because if I don't like the lyrics, I will just cut it out and I'll arrange it myself. So I didn't like what was said right here. So instead of the lyric, I just, I just had her say down three times. So it's a little bit of a vocal writing there. For a second half of the track, there was a chorus that came with this stem. I didn't like the chorus. I thought it was kind of bad. I didn't like the key. It didn't match the song, um, which obviously I didn't need to add a vocal to this track. I just, you know, Sometimes every once in a while you want to make a vocal track. So you just grab a sample pack and, you know, throw it in and make a little vocal track. It's not a big deal. But I didn't like the chorus. So I thought, what can I do here? Because it sounded weird if I just had the vocal in half the track. Um, and we did this. So for a second half of the track, I took the chorus and I reversed it because I thought, honestly, whatever she's saying here backwards sounded a lot better than what was being said originally. It fit the track a lot better. And uh, I just like when you don't really know what the lyrics are saying. I just kind of enjoy that. Uh, so one of my big inspirations in like, you know, that got me into music was uh, the Kingdom Hearts series. I always had great tracks with the game releases like Kingdom Hearts 1, Symbol and Clean, Kingdom Hearts 2, Sanctuary, you know, Face My Fears came out with Skrillex. Uh, and in Sanctuary, which is one of my personal favorites, there's actually a lot of backwards vocals in it. So ever since when I was a little kid, I, you know, I love that song God on a CD. Uh, and I've always enjoyed backwards vocals. And I've always, I've not been afraid to put them in my tracks. I know some producers, they think it's, it sounds weird. Um, or like it's gimmicky. I never thought that. I always thought it was cool. So I thought, why not throw it in here? Um, you know, in lieu of having a good chorus, I'll just make one out backwards vocals. So that's what I did, and I think I think it sounded pretty cool. I think it came out well, and I really like um, really like how it turned out. I think it fits the track well. Um, and then here at the end, the delay. Uh, this envelope, this room FX, you can see it turn on. It's just extra, extra, extra delay, so the uh, this line carries into the breakdown. It just helps the transition a little bit. I do that for a lot of sounds, like a lot of my projects, I'll have the delay um, carry in. Like even on the bell right here, you can see the serum effects go way up on the bell right when it's about going into the breakdown. Um, so it's just a good technique if you want to make your transitions a little bit smoother. So next let's go into the breakdown and I made these chords, nothing crazy. There's a couple violin chords. Um, I, I wanted to have like a kind of big feeling breakdown, like sweeping. I should probably have, I probably have to move it up because of the uh, the way FL works. It's like the way FL works when we play a pattern, the snapshots automation position. So you have to like snapshot in a good position. I snapshotting where it's low pass, so I just had to move the cursor. Um, now you'll be able to hear it. You hear the uh, envelope slowly opening. And then the second chord. And then the extra note right at the end. So it, it's just a little texture in the back is, uh, I just wanted to have the violin chords coming in, um, ramping up to kind of build that tension without doing like 
a riser to keep it kind of emotional. Um, this is just low pass. I have black hole for reverb, of course. 66%. Pretty, pretty high amount. 90 size. Like, this is a ton of reverb on here, but I love reverb. And then this is just a boost at 600 uh, and the low, low cut. Nothing crazy. It really just a super simple violin. I think even it's coming from labs, which is just like... It's just strings. You like, there's not even really any parameters to change. It's just like a sample player, um, which is free by the way. You should all get Labs. Labs is a super great product. Uh, but it, yeah, it's just a simple violin sound. I could have used Contact, but you know, in the essence of speed, which I love to write fast, I just like let me just throw Labs in and get a violin down. And usually, when you're throwing something in quick, just to hear how it sounds, usually. If it sounds good, why change it, right? Like if I if my plan was to throw in violins and I threw in labs to try it out, because labs is really fast and it sounds great, why would I go take it out, re-add contact, and then have to like sound sculpt with all the parameters and contact like to make a good violin? Like I already had a good violin. I didn't need to uh, go remake it. I can just use what works and what sounds good. People won't know right when they listen to it. Well. Now they're gonna know because I made the tutorial right now. But like, if without the tutorial, they wouldn't know. So, you know, generally it doesn't matter. You can do whatever sounds good. Um, something else that's in the in the breakdown is this little sound down here. It's kind of like a pluck texture. It's not really like. It's not playing like any solid uh, melody or rhythm. It's not hitting on the MIDI notes. It's like uh, it's like grain trigger. Where is that? I'm pretty sure it's a grain. Uh, pattern 13. Yeah, as I thought. Um, so what I did is I rendered a synth pluck from Serum. It was my sound design, and I put it into a granular synth. Uh, this is FL Stock Granulizer. It's pretty cool and pretty much it just like separates the grains of the sounds and makes them trigger at like different times and like different rates and ratios. It's pretty cool. I think uh, I use granular on my other track on the EP coming out later, uh, which will all go into depth more in depth when I get there. But I just I just put a little granulizer on it to break up the pluck a little bit, so it's not like so perfect on the MIDI every time. It's more randomized. Um, and on, on top of the grain, we have a sound goodizer, which is a great little plugin. You all know about it. People say it's a meme. If it makes it try, if it makes it sound good. Then like you know, what's the meme? Uh, I got parametric, just cut out some of the highs. Black hole, you know, I love reverb. A delay, serum FX. Uh, I did an EQ boost overall. I just dragged it up. I guess this is like um, a technique people can use instead of doing like a gain knob. I didn't feel like loading my gain knob since it's a little bit uh, glitchy, so I thought, well, I'll just boost my EQ every- I mean, it's the same effect, right? I'm just making it louder. And then a low pass, or sorry, low cut, and then a filter. And I had a sidechain because at one point this is playing with the drop. I decided not to um, have it in the drop and it just got left over. Like a lot of other things, things are just left over in here. So that's the breakdown, and I'll play it with everything. Let me turn on like all the synths, and I'll mute the FX for now. So you can hear the bells filtered, the bells very delayed, it's low passed, the bass is high passed, the violin's coming in, the pluck is on top. Yeah, that sets a uh, engine sample. So it all comes together and makes a really nice texture, all the elements in the uh, breakdown. So what's next? I guess we can cover the drums. So the drums. The reason why I did these last is because it's, you know, some people synthesize their drums. I didn't for this track. So it's pretty much just sample selection and like chopping things up. So let me mute everything except for the drums. Uh, 
uh, it's pretty simple stuff. Um, I'm still doing the technique where I like to chop up loops. I think that's the best way to get percussion rhythms is uh, loop chopping. So, you know, this is a full loop, right? And then chopped up, it just... So just playing with it, making a rhythm that's cool. Um, and then this is a loop as well. And I, I chop that up to just be this. And then together with the kick, it makes a really cool rhythm. Both, uh, both of the chopped up loops with the kick. And that's how I get a lot of my drums is like, I, I just like to chop up loops. And then later on we have just more hi-hats. But that, that core percussion rhythm, that chop loop is still there. All right, so let's talk about the drum processing, um, which really there isn't really a lot of processing on the drums in this track. Um, like this, the kick got a little bit of high shelf reduction. I didn't like the way it sounded with the high end on it. I thought I'd just take it out like it wasn't necessary for the, for the kick. Um, the serum effects here, I was playing with the idea of having a double kick. It didn't work out that way. I it didn't like the, the feeling of the double kick, so I just, uh, you know, disabled it and move on. Um, I have some filters to high pass the kick later. Really not a lot of processing. Uh, this is one of the chop loops. It has a reverb from Serum FX, a little bit of EQ, the sidechain, this got an EQ, sidechain, nothing, nothing, sidechain, nothing. Which I do like to sidechain my, some of my drum sounds because if it's hitting with the kick, sometimes it can be a little bit overpowering. And it, you know, if you don't want it to be overpowering, you can just do a little bit of sidechain and it won't, it won't like take over your kick transient, uh, that's something I do sometimes, like for the hi hats. I thought I thought I'd side chain them a little bit, give them a little bit of pump, so it doesn't compete with the transient of the kick. Um, but other than that, it's really just like uh, level adjustments, like balancing the mix. Because if you have a balanced, like if your if your samples are good, all you have to do is balance them. You don't have to worry about the processing. And like I feel like I pick pretty good samples. I mean, I like them, so I didn't have to do a lot. I just process um balance them that's all so let's talk about the effects a little bit um we have one effect here which is like kind of clappy i'll solo this and it's like just automation channels you can hear it sounds like a clap like a very reverby clap and then the other effects that we have is this one which is a lot more airy and this is more like the main effects that happens way more in the track. Um, the clap type one is just used to like compensate on transitions I feel are a little bit weak. So you can see like the four points where I stack it up are like four points in a track where I feel like it needed a bigger impact. So I helped I helped the airy effects out by layering with the clap effects and it just made like together. It sounds a lot bigger of a sound. Um, something else I did was I cloned this the area effects and I reversed it and it swept into itself so it just makes for a smoother transition overall if there's like a little pre-sweep involved uh the last sound for effects is this boom and that was added like well if we go to master you can see like the FX boom is on 22. it's not color coded it's not um yellow or anything it's going straight to the master uh the reason for that is because when I make a song, sometimes I'll fully mix master it and I'll listen to it back again and I'll want to add something or take something out or change something. This bass impact didn't exist in the first render of the track. I went back in and I was like, you know, I think it needs a bass impact on the transition. So I just added it and I just balanced it to the master version. So it just goes straight to the master. It doesn't go in through any processing, any buses, anything like that. It goes straight out because it's something I was adding after the mix was already done, after the master was already done. It's like an additional sound I was adding in. 
you could obviously you could you know when you're adding those sounds in you could name it oh impact three give it yeah make it yellow impact three right slide over organize it send into the fx bus all this stuff you don't have to do that if you're just adding a little sound at the end to sit like under or on top of your master you can just send it right out to the master and that's one reason why i like to keep my master uh clean we have vox Engo on here but that's just because i use it to record audio for the tutorial but like generally uh, i keep my master like empty of everything so like when i do go back to add things after the fact it, it won't it won't um color the sound anyway i can just add it directly and it's not a problem so one last thing i want to touch on in the project is the track structuring um so you can see like the name of the project is dragon's gamble radio edit this was not the first um layout that i went with I actually went through a whole bunch of different layouts in my project i had super long intro super long outros i had a way longer breakdown i had like multi-drop sections and it you know as it, through experimenting with the track i felt like i didn't need all those extra things um so i went with i tried to make like not a radio edit for the radio i just like that's just what i called it it's a shortened version of the track and i think it made it a lot more condensed and like it end up working a lot better for the project as a whole uh, because you don't need all extra space in your project if you if you just have dead space that doesn't mean anything like to you artistically or for the listener's experience it shouldn't be there you just take it out so i end up going with the shorter version of the track um so intro uh would be the first section and we have just the bell lead uh low pass and the envelope slowly opens up and then the drums come in with a bass and then it drops into the first drop section with the vocals coming in we do have a fill here which gets mirrored in the second half of the track um which instead of doing a drum fill i just had to go with the bass fill so we have this extra bass melody here uh, playing a different riff than the other or like a different rhythm than the other basses you can hear it's a little bit different uh, i decided to go with the bass fill instead of the drum fill just because drum fills like everyone does drum fills they're great don't get me wrong i love drum fills and just for this track i want to do a bass fill so it goes in the chorus following standard structure here we're keeping everything four like four bars long ish uh, or at least counting in fours and then we do a breakdown which used to be a lot longer it was shortened just because it didn't need extra space um, and then something I did was I delayed the um, the drums coming in. I have just a segment of just the vocals after the breakdown ends, which I'll play right here. So technically, even though the drop starts, oops, even though technically the drop starts right here on this line. I don't bring in all the elements until the vocals have gone through their first phrase. I think it makes a, like a, a dramatic moment, and I liked uh, I liked the effect it gave because I was having trouble going from breakdown to drop. It just it was kind of awkward. I think coming up with this idea of like a stall, which if you listen to like rhythm, uh, there's a lot of stalls where it's just the bass playing for a couple seconds and then the drops come in after i thought that was doing like a vocal stall and it really worked out nicely i thought it was a really cool effect for the track uh and then it's pretty much just you know chorus and the verse these two sections and i do have the other uh other bell coming in there which we talked about with the distortion and then slowly bring out the hi-hats bring out the claps high passing the kick and then like a you know a reverb and delay tail to end out the track for the outro so that's what i went with for the structure of this track it's definitely not like uh i mean it's pretty standard but i think i did some techniques here that might not be that standard such as the bass fills and the uh stalls since we were just talking about uh structuring uh so it's a good time to bring in the uh bell sound design again um so if i just play this section sounds different right compared to this section at least that's because the distortion is enabled but um 
it's doing something tricky, which you might not expect. And it explains why we have the extra sine wave from earlier. So if I open this, uh, the bottom four notes are being played by this uh, serum. It's a clone of the other sound, but distortion is maxed. The other top notes are playing cleanly. The distortion is still disabled on those. Like if I mute the bottom notes, oops, that here. They're playing clean. The bottom notes have distortion. The distortion is the reason why we need this extra envelope. If I turn off this envelope and we have just a sub, this is what it sounds like. Because the distortion is so hard, it's pushing the sign up against the ceiling and it totally squishes it. It turns into a square. So how do we how do we avoid the square sound? If we add subharmonics on under the sign, the sub sign, which is actually our top sign, we add a sub to our sign, it adds those harmonics and it breaks up the distortion. It makes it so it doesn't, um, even if the top gets crushed, there's still information underneath that can't reach the top and doesn't get distorted. It's what causes that kind of detuned sound. So even though it's totally silent without distortion, like distortion brings out the reason why we have this extra sign we can't hear because it's so quiet. It's just for subharmonics, which affect the distortion. That's all. Um, so it's just a little sound design trick. If you if you ever want to distort something, like really hard, like a really hard distortion, throw some subharmonics underneath and see what happens. You might be surprised with the result. Um, so yeah, that's why we, uh, that's why we have the bell. It sounds different. It's this yellow envelope right here. It ramps up and the distortion comes in. That's all that is. Um, it was to break up the structure of the track. Like the first half has this certain vibe. It's a lot softer. And then as the track progresses, I want the feeling of aggression or tension or whatever you want to call it increase. And so for the second half, I have you know the distortion really open up and start crushing the sound and i think it makes for a nice effect it's a nice uh a nice change on the ears as the track progresses um what's next let's go over the buses so this is how i do my mixer drums red bass orange synths and other things blue fx yellow they all go into their own uh, bus. So we have the drum bus, the bass bus, the synth bus, and the FX bus. Uh, all the drums go in the drum bus, the bass goes in the bass bus, synth, synth bus, blah, 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 FX, X, FX bus. Generally, I don't do very much processing on my buses. Um, I keep them pretty, uh, you know, empty, unless it really needs it. Generally, what I'll do is like for a drum bus, is I will make sure that my lows are mono and I'll spread the stereo on my highs a little bit. Um, just cause like, if you want brightness in your drums, but you don't want to like actually increase the frequency or like the loudness of the highs, you can just spread the stereo of the highs a little bit and it gives it that brightness without um, increasing loudness. It's pretty cool. I use that technique a lot. Uh, my bass bus, um, Honestly, I didn't. I probably could have done this with this Maximus, but just out of habit, I decided to do it in the bass bus. If I had multiple basses, for sure I'd want to use the, the bus, but I only had one bass, so like, it's really just a formality. It's just a habit of mine. I didn't have to go into the bus because I only had one bass. Like, why why put only one guy in the bus, right? You should, you just take a car. So I wouldn't need to use the bus for my one bass, but I did anyways. Um, it's just... uh. Just a little bit of compression on the different frequencies, tighten up a little bit. The synths, I didn't do anything. Usually I do the same thing, but I didn't feel like it needed it. You know, you don't have to have these the rules that you do every single time, every single track. You do the same technique every time, you know, just feel it out. Usually I would have uh, a Maximus to compress stuff, frequencies on my synth bus, but I just didn't do it for this track. I didn't think I needed it. FX bus, nothing. Um, and then for the 
I do two pre-masters before going to file master. The file master I keep blank. Um, I only have a Voxengo here so I can record the audio into OBS to make this tutorial. Usually this would be gone, this would be max volume, it'd be empty. I like to have my master, like my true master, absolutely empty. I don't like anything in that in that uh, chain. So I do two pre-masters instead and then they both go into uh, the actual master. So pre-master is Maximus. Again, this is just um, for a little everything. So this is just a sub. I'm forcing it all mono. This is just the kick in the bass. Just the mids. I didn't do anything to it. I didn't need it. The highs, some of the sounds were a little bit... Um, you can see how like some of the sounds on the highs peak a little bit too high. So I just capped them. I just did a little bit of compression. You see it's just barely any caps. There's a super small compression on the highs. And I spread the highs even more. So this is spreading the synth highs and the drum highs. Um, and the bass highs. I don't know if there are any, but like the little tiny bass highs that we have, they're getting spread. Just making the high really stereo. Um, make it really bright. Turn anything back on. And then my final, 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 final master step is Elevate. Um, I love this plugin. It's totally worth it. If you're looking for mastering software, get Elevate. Like, I've never been able to get tracks as loud and as clean before I had Elevate. Um, I don't really do much on this track. Like, it's really good at solving a lot of problems with your mix and master, but if you mix properly, you don't need to, like, do all this stuff. You can just have your track exist as it is. So I just did a small uh, limiter gain. I just boost up 4 dB. Uh, left everything else pretty much the same. I did a little bit of drive, a little bit of drive, just one tenth of a dB, nothing crazy. There's some tracks where, you know, you crank this, you want your track to be pumping, distorted, crunchy, slamming. This is not one of those tracks, obviously. You can tell with like, it's chill vibes. So I didn't, I didn't really pump it all, just a little bit, a little bit of salt on top. And that's it, that's my track, that's Dragon's Gamble. So, uh... I hope you enjoyed watching this. I hope you learned something about my production techniques. And uh, I'll catch you on the next tutorial.